Third Act Scene The library in Lord Goring's house. An Adam room. On the right is the door leading into the hall. On the left, the door of the smoking room. A pair of folding doors at the back open into the drawing room. The fire is lit. Phipps, the butler, is arranging some newspapers on the writing table. The distinction of Phipps is his impassivity. He has been termed by enthusiasts the ideal butler. The Sphinx is not so incommunicable. He is a mask with a manner. Of his intellectual or emotional life, history knows nothing. He represents the dominance of form. Enter Lord Goring in evening dress with a buttonhole. He is wearing a silk hat and Inverness cape. White-gloved, he carries a Louis XVI cane. His are all the delicate fopperies of fashion. One sees that he stands in immediate relation to modern life, makes it, indeed, and so masters it. He is the first well-dressed philosopher in the history of thought. Got my second buttonhole for me, Phipps? Yes, my lord. Takes his hat, cane, and cape, and presents new buttonhole on salver. Rather distinguished thing, Phipps. I am the only person of the smallest importance in London, at present, who wears a buttonhole. Yes, my lord, I have observed that. Taking out old buttonhole. You see, Phipps, fashion is what one wears oneself. What is unfashionable is what other people wear. Yes, my lord just as vulgarity is simply the conduct of other people. Yes, my lord. Putting in a new buttonhole. And falsehoods the truths of other people. Yes, my lord. Other people are quite dreadful. The only possible society is oneself. Yes, my lord. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance, Phipps. Yes, my lord. Looking at himself in the glass. Don't think I quite like this buttonhole, Phipps. Makes me look a little too... old. Makes me almost in the prime of life, eh, Phipps? I don't observe any alteration in your lordship's appearance. You don't, Phipps? No, my lord. I am not quite sure. For the future, a more trivial buttonhole, Phipps, on Thursday evenings. I will speak to the florist, my lord. She has had a loss in her family lately, which perhaps accounts for the lack of triviality your lordship's complains of in the buttonhole. Extraordinary thing about the lower classes in England. They are always losing their relations. Yes, my lord. They are extremely fortunate in that respect. Turns round and looks at him. Phipps remains impassive. Hmm. Any letters, Phipps? Three, my lord. Hands letters on salver. Takes letters. Want my cab around in twenty minutes. Yes, my lord. Goes towards door. Holds up letter in pink envelope. <clears throat> Vips. When did this letter arrive? It was brought by hand just after your lordship went to the club. That will do. Exit Phipps. Lady Chiltern's handwriting on Lady Chiltern's pink notepaper. That is rather curious. I thought Robert was to write. Wonder what Lady Chiltern has got to say to me. Sits at bureau and opens letter and reads it. I want you, I trust you, I am coming to you, Gertrude. Puts down the letter with a puzzled look, then takes it up and reads it again slowly. I want you, I trust you, I am coming to you. So she has found out everything. Oh, poor woman. Poor woman. Pulls out watch and looks at it. Hm. But what an hour to call, ten o'clock. 
Oh, I shall have to give up going to the Berkshires. However, it is always nice to be expected and not to arrive. I am not expected at the bachelor's, so I shall certainly go there. Well, I will make her stand by her husband. That is the only thing for her to do. That is the only thing for any woman to do. It is the growth of the moral sense in women that makes marriage such a hopeless, one-sided institution. Uh, ten o'clock. She should be here soon. I must tell Phipps I am not in to anyone else. Goes towards Bell. Enter Phipps. Lord Caversham. Oh, why will parents always appear at the wrong time? Some extraordinary mistake in nature, I suppose. Enter Lord Caversham. Delighted to see you, my dear father. Goes to meet him. Take my cloak off. Is it worth while, father? Of course it is worth while, sir. Which is the most comfortable chair? This one, father. It is a chair I use myself when I have visitors. Thank ye. No draught, I hope, in this room? No, father. Sitting down. Glad to hear it. Can't stand draughts. No draughts at home. Good many breezes, father. Eh? Eh? Don't understand what you mean. Want to have a serious conversation with you, sir. My dear father, at this hour... Well, sir, it is only ten o'clock. What is your objection to the hour? I think the hour is an admirable hour. Well, the fact is, father, this is not my day for talking seriously. I, I am very sorry, but it is not my day. What do you mean, sir? During the season, father, I only talk seriously on the first Tuesday in every month from four to seven. Well, make it Tuesday, sir. Make it Tuesday. But it is after seven, father, and my doctor says I must not have any serious conversation after seven. It makes me talk in my sleep. Talk in your sleep, sir? What does that matter? You are not married? No, father, I am not married. Hum. That is what I have come to talk to you about, sir. You have got to get married, and at once. Why, when I was your age, sir, I had been an inconsolable widower for three months, and was already paying my addresses to your admirable mother. Damn me, sir, it is your duty to get married. You can't always be living for pleasure. Every man of position is married nowadays. Bachelors are not fashionable any more. They are a damaged lot. Too much is known about them. You must get a wife, sir. Look where your friend Robert Chilton has got by probity, hard work, and a sensible marriage with a good woman. Why don't you imitate him, sir? Why don't you take him for your model? I think I shall, father. I wish you would, sir. Then I should be happy. At present I make your mother's life miserable on your account. You are heartless, sir, quite heartless. I hope not, father. And it is high time for you to get married. You are thirty-four years of age, sir. Yes, father, but I only admit to thirty-two. Thirty-one and a half, when I have a really good buttonhole. This buttonhole is not uh, trivial enough. I tell you, you are thirty-four, sir. And there is a draught in your room besides, which makes your conduct worse. Why did you tell me there was no draught, sir? I feel a draught, sir. I feel it distinctly. So do I, father. It is a dreadful draught. I will come and see you to-morrow, father. We can talk over anything you like. Let me help you on with your cloak, father. No, sir. I have called this evening for a definite purpose, and I am going to see it through at all costs to my health or yours. Put down my cloak, sir. Certainly, father. But let us go into another room. Rings bell. There is a dreadful draught here. Enter Phipps. Phipps, is there a good fire in the smoking room? Yes, my lord. Come in there, father. Your sneezes are quite heart-rending. 
Well, sir, I suppose I have a right to sneeze when I choose. Apologetically. Quite so, father. I was merely expressing sympathy. Oh, damn sympathy. There's a great deal too much of that sort of thing going on nowadays. I quite agree with you, father. If there was less sympathy in the world, there would be less trouble in the world. Goes towards the smoking room. That is a paradox, sir. I hate paradoxes. So do I, father. Everybody one meets is a paradox nowadays. It is a great bore. It makes society so obvious. Turning round and looking at his son beneath his bushy eyebrows. Do you always really understand what you say, sir? After some hesitation. Yes, father, if I listen attentively. Indignantly. If you listen attentively, conceited young puppy. Goes off grumbling into the smoking room. Phipps enters. Phipps, there is a lady coming to see me this evening on particular business. Show her into the drawing room when she arrives, you understand? Yes, my lord. It is a matter of gravest importance, Phipps. I understand, my lord. No one else is to be admitted under any circumstances. I understand, my lord. Bell rings. Ah, that is probably the lady. I shall see her myself. Just as he is going towards the door, Lord Caversham enters from the smoking room. Well, sir, am I to wait attendance on you? Considerably perplexed. In a moment, father, do excuse me. Lord Caversham goes back. Remember my instruction, Phipps, into that room. Yes, my lord. Lord Goring goes into the smoking room. Harold, the footman, shows Mrs. Cheveley in. Lemia like she is in green and silver. She has a cloak of black satin, lined with dead rose-leaf silk. What name, madam? To Phipps, who advances towards her. Is Lord Goring not here? I was told he was at home. His lordship is engaged at present with Lord Caversham, madam. Turns a cold, glassy eye on Harold, who at once retires. To herself. How very filial. His lordship told me to ask you, madam, to be kind enough to wait in the drawing-room for him. His lordship will come to you there. With a look of surprise. Lord Goring expects me. Yes, madam. Are you quite sure? His lordship told me that if a lady called, I was to ask her to wait in the drawing-room. Goes to the door of the drawing-room and opens it. His lordship's directions on the subject were very precise. To herself. How thoughtful of him. To expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. Goes towards the drawing-room and looks in. Ugh! How dreary a bachelor's drawing-room always looks! I shall have to alter all this. Phipps brings the lamp from the writing-table. No, I don't care for that lamp. It is far too glaring. Light some candles. Replaces lamp. Certainly, madam. I hope the candles have very becoming shades. We have had no complaint about them, madam, as yet. Passes into the drawing-room and begins to light the candles. To herself. I wonder what woman he is waiting for to-night. It will be delightful to catch him. Men always look so silly when they are caught. And they are always being caught. Looks about the room and approaches the writing-table. What a very interesting room. What a very interesting picture. Wonder what his correspondence is like. Takes up letters. Oh, what a very uninteresting correspondence. Bills and cards, debts and dowagers. Who on earth writes to him on pink paper? How silly to write on pink paper. It looks like the beginning of a middle-class romance. Romance should never begin with sentiment. It should begin with science and end with a settlement. 
puts letter down, then takes it up again. I know that handwriting. That is Gertrude Chiltern's. I remember it perfectly. The Ten Commandments in every stroke of the pen, and the moral law all over the page. Wonder what Gertrude is writing to him about. Something horrid about me, I suppose. How I detest that woman. Reads it. I trust you, I want you, I am coming to you, Gertrude. I trust you, I want you, I am coming to you. A look of triumph comes over her face. She is just about to steal the letter when Phipps comes in. The candles in the drawing-room are lit, madam, as you directed. Thank you. Rises hastily and slips the letter under a large silver-cased blotting-book that is lying on the table. I trust the shades will be to your liking, madam. They are the most becoming we have. They are the same as his lordship uses himself when he is dressing for dinner. With a smile. Then I am sure they will be perfectly right. Gravely. Thank you, madam. Mrs. Cheveley goes into the drawing-room. Phipps closes the door and retires. The door is then slowly opened, and Mrs. Cheveley comes out and creeps stealthily towards the writing-table. Suddenly voices are heard from the smoking-room, and Mrs. Cheveley grows pale. She stops. The voices grow louder, and she goes back into the drawing-room, biting her lip. Enter Lord Goring and Lord Caversham. Expostulating. My dear father, if I am to get married, surely you will allow me to choose the time, place, and person, particularly the person. Testily. That is a matter for me, sir. You would probably make a very poor choice. It is I who should be consulted, not you. There is property at stake. It is not a matter for affection. Affection comes later on in married life. Yes. In married life, affection comes when people thoroughly dislike each other, father, doesn't it? Puts on Lord Caversham's cloak for him. Certainly, sir. I mean, certainly not, sir. You are talking very foolishly to-night. What I say is that marriage is a matter for common sense. But women who have common sense are so curiously plain, father, aren't they? Of course, I only speak from hearsay. No woman, plain or pretty, has any common sense at all, sir. Common sense is the privilege of our sex. Quite so. And we men are so self-sacrificing that we never use it, do we, father? I use it, sir. I use nothing else. So my mother tells me. It is the secret of your mother's happiness. You are very heartless, sir, very heartless. I hope not, father. Goes out for a moment, then returns, looking rather put out, with Sir Robert Chilton. "'My dear Arthur, what a piece of good luck meeting you on the doorstep. "'Your servant had just told me you were not at home. "'How extraordinary!' "'The fact is, I am horribly busy to-night, Robert, "'and I gave orders I was not at home to anyone. "'Even my father had a comparatively cold reception. "'He complained of a draught the whole time. "'Ah, you must be at home to me, Arthur. "'You are my best friend. "'Perhaps by to-morrow you will be my only friend.' My wife has discovered everything. Ah, I guessed as much. Looking at him. Really? How? After some hesitation. Oh, merely by something in the expression of your face as you came in. Who told her? Mrs. Cheveley herself. And the woman I love knows that I began my career with an act of low dishonesty— that I built up my life upon sands of shame, that I sold, like a common huckster, the secret that had been entrusted to me as a man of honour. I thank heaven poor Lord Radley died without knowing that I betrayed him. I would to God I had died before I had been so horribly tempted, or had fallen so low. Burying his face in his hands. After a pause. You have heard nothing from Vienna yet, in answer to your wire? Looking up. Yes, I got a telegram from the First Secretary at eight o'clock tonight. Well? 
Nothing is absolutely known against her. On the contrary, she occupies a rather high position in society. It is a sort of open secret that Baron Arnheim left her the greater portion of his immense fortune. Beyond that, I can learn nothing. She doesn't turn out to be a spy, then? Oh, spies are of no use nowadays. Their profession is over. The newspapers do their work instead. And thunderingly well they do it. Arthur, I'm parched with thirst. May I ring for something? Some hock and seltzer? Certainly. Let me. Rings the bell. Thanks. I don't know what to do, Arthur. I don't know what to do, and you are my only friend. But what a friend you are, the one friend I can trust. I can trust you absolutely, can't I? Enter Phipps. My dear Robert, of course. Oh, to Phipps. Uh, bring some hock and seltzer. Yes, my lord. And Phipps? Yes, my lord. Will you excuse me for a moment, Robert? I want to give some directions to my servant. Certainly. When that lady calls, tell her that I am not expected home this evening. Tell her that I have been suddenly called out of town. You understand? The lady is in that room, my lord. You told me to show her into that room, my lord. You did per perfectly right. Exit, Phipps. What a mess I am in. No, I think I shall get through it. I'll give her a lecture through the door. Awkward thing to manage, though. Arthur, tell me what I should do. My life seems to have crumbled about me. I am a ship without a rudder in a night without a star. Robert, you love your wife, don't you? I love her more than anything in the world. I used to think ambition the great thing. It is not. Love is the great thing in the world. There is nothing but love, and I love her. But I am defamed in her eyes. I am ignoble in her eyes. There is a wide gulf between us now. She has found me out, Arthur. She has found me out. Has she never in her life done some folly, some indiscretion, that she should not forgive your sin? My wife, never. She does not know what weakness or temptation is. I am of clay like other men. She stands apart as good women do, pitiless in her perfection, cold and stern and without mercy. But I love her, Arthur. We are childless, and I have no one else to love, no one else to love me. Perhaps if God had sent us children, she might have been kinder to me. But God has given us a lonely house, and she has cut my heart in two. Don't let us talk of it. I was brutal to her this evening. But I suppose when sinners talk to saints, they are brutal always. I said to her things that were hideously true on my side, from my standpoint, from the standpoint of men. But don't let's talk of that. Your wife will forgive you. Perhaps at this moment she is forgiving you. She loves you, Robert. Why should she not forgive? God grant it. God grant it. Buries his face in his hands. But there is something more I have to tell you, Arthur. Enter Phipps with drinks. Hands hock and seltzer to Sir Robert Chilton. Hock and seltzer, sir. Thank you. Is your carriage here, Robert? Uh, no, I've walked from the club. Sir Robert will take my cab, Phipps. Yes, my lord. Exit. Robert, you don't mind my sending you away? Arthur, you must let me stay for five minutes. I have made up my mind what I'm going to do tonight in the house. The debate on the Argentine Canal is to begin at eleven. A chair falls in the drawing room. What is that? Nothing. I heard a chair fall in the next room. Someone's been listening. No, no, there is no one there. There is someone. There are some lights in the room. The door is ajar. Someone's been listening to every secret of my life. 
Arthur, what does this mean? Robert, you are excited, unnerved. I tell you there is no one in that room. Sit down, Robert. Do you give me your word of honour there is no one there? Yes. Your word of honour? Sits down. Yes. Rises. Arthur, let me see for myself. No, no. If there is no one there, why should I not look in that room? Arthur, you must let me go into that room and satisfy myself. Let me know that no eavesdropper has heard my life's secret. Arthur, you don't realize what I'm going through. Robert, this must stop. I have told you there is no one in that room. That is enough. Rushes to the door of the room. It is not enough. I insist on going into this room. You have told me there is no one there, so what reason can you have for refusing me? For God's sake, don't. There is someone there. Someone whom you must not see. Ah, I thought so. I forbid you to enter that room. Stand back. My life is at stake, and I don't care who is there. I will know who it is to whom I have told my secret and my shame. Enters room. Great heavens, his own wife. Sir Robert Chilton comes back with a look of scorn and anger on his face. What explanation have you to give for the presence of that woman here? Robert, I swear to you on my honour that the lady is stainless and guiltless of all offence toward you. She is a vile and infamous thing. Don't say that, Robert. It was for your sake she came here. It was to try and save you she came here. She loves you and no one else. You are mad. What have I to do with her intrigues with you? Let her remain your mistress. You are well suited to each other. She, corrupt and shameful, you, false as a friend, treacherous as an enemy even. It is not true, Robert. Before heaven it is not true. In her presence and in yours I will explain all. Let me pass, sir. You have lied enough upon your word of honour. Sir Robert Chilton goes out. Lord Goring rushes to the door of the drawing-room, when Mrs. Cheveley comes out, looking radiant and much amused. With a mock curtsy. Good evening, Lord Goring. Mrs. Cheveley? Great heavens! May I ask what you were doing in my drawing-room? Merely listening. I have a perfect passion for listening through keyholes. One always hears such wonderful things through them. Doesn't that sound rather like tempting Providence? Oh, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time. Makes a sign to him to take her cloak off, which he does. I'm glad you have called. I am going to give you some good advice. Oh, pray don't. One should never give a woman anything that she can't wear in the evening. I see you are quite as willful as you used to be. Far more. I have greatly improved. I have had more experience. Too much experience is a dangerous thing. Pray, have a cigarette. Half the pretty women in London smoke cigarettes. Personally, I prefer the other half. Thanks. I never smoke. My dressmaker wouldn't like it, and a woman's first duty in life is to her dressmaker, isn't it? What the second duty is, no one has as yet discovered. You have come here to sell me Robert Chilton's letter, haven't you? To offer it to you on conditions. How did you guess that? Because you haven't mentioned the subject. Have you got it with you? Sitting down. Oh, no. A well-made dress has no pockets. What is your price for it? How absurdly English you are! The English think that a cheque-book can solve every problem in life. Why, my dear Arthur, I have very much more money than you have, and quite as much as Robert Chiltern has got hold of. Money is not what I want. What do you want, then, Mrs. Cheveley? Why don't you call me Laura? I don't like the name. You used to adore it. Yes, that's why. Mrs. Cheveley motions to him to sit down beside her, 
He smiles and does so. Arthur, you loved me once. Yes. And you asked me to be your wife. That was the natural result of my loving you. And you threw me over because you saw, or said you saw, poor old Lord Mortlake trying to have a violent flirtation with me in the conservatory at Tenby. I am under the impression that my lawyer settled that matter with you on certain terms, dictated by yourself. At that time I was poor. You were rich. Quite so. That is why you pretended to love me. Shrugging her shoulders. Poor old Lord Mortlake, who had only two topics of conversation, his gout and his wife. I never could quite make out which of the two he was talking about. He used the most horrible language about them both. Well, you were silly, Arthur. Why, Lord Mortlake was never anything more to me than an amusement. One of those utterly tedious amusements one only finds at an English country house on an English country Sunday. I don't think any one at all morally responsible for what he or she does at an English country house. Yes, I know lots of people think that. I loved you, Arthur. My dear Mrs. Cheveley, you have always been far too clever to know anything about love. I did love you, and you loved me. You know you loved me. And love is a very wonderful thing. I suppose that when a man has once loved a woman, he will do anything for her, except continue to love her. Puts her hand on his, taking his hand away quietly. Yes, except that. After a pause. I am tired of living abroad. I want to come back to London. I want to have a charming house here. I want to have a salon. If one could only teach the English how to talk, and the Irish how to listen, society here would be quite civilized. Besides, I have arrived at the romantic stage. When I saw you last night at the Chilterns, I knew you were the only person I had ever cared for, if I ever have cared for anybody, Arthur. And so— on the morning of the day you marry me, I will give you Robert Chiltern's letter. That is my offer. I will give it to you now, if you promise to marry me. Now. Smiling. Tomorrow. Are you really serious? Yes, quite serious. I should make you a very bad husband. I don't mind bad husbands. I have had two. They amuse me immensely. You mean that you amused yourself immensely, don't you? What do you know about my married life? Nothing, but I can read it like a book. What book? Rising. The Book of Numbers. Do you think it is quite charming of you to be so rude to a woman in your own house? In the case of a very fascinating woman, sex is a challenge, not a defense. I suppose that is meant for a compliment. My dear Arthur, women are never disarmed by compliments. Men always are. That is the difference between the two sexes. Women are never disarmed by anything, as far as I know them. After a pause. Then you are going to allow your greatest friend, Robert Chiltern, to be ruined, rather than marry someone who really has considerable attractions left? I thought you would have risen to some great height of self-sacrifice, Arthur. I think you should. And the rest of your life you could spend in contemplating your own perfections. Oh, I do that as it is. And self-sacrifice is a thing that should be put down by law. It is so demoralizing to the people for one whom sacrifices oneself. They always go to the bad. As if anything could demoralize Robert Chiltern. You seem to forget that I know his real character. What you know about him is not his real character. It was an act of folly done in his youth. Dishonorable, I admit. Shameful, I admit. Unworthy of him, I admit. And therefore, not his true character. How you men stand up for each other. 
How you women war against each other. Bitterly. I only war against one woman, against Gertrude Chiltern. I hate her. I hate her now more than ever. Because you have brought a real tragedy into her life, I suppose. With a sneer. Oh, there is only one real tragedy in a woman's life. The fact that her past is always her lover, and her future invariably her husband. Lady Chiltern knows nothing of the kind of life to which you are alluding. A woman whose size in gloves is seven and three quarters never knows much about anything. You know Gertrude has always worn a seven and three quarters. That is one of the reasons why there was never any moral sympathy between us. Well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview may be regarded as at an end. You admit it was romantic, don't you? For the privilege of being your wife, I was ready to surrender a great prize, the climax of my diplomatic career. You decline. Very well. If Sir Robert doesn't uphold my Argentine scheme, I expose him. Voix tu? You mustn't do that. It would be vile, horrible, infamous. Shrugging her shoulders. Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. It is a commercial transaction. That is all. There is no good mixing up sentimentality in it. I offered to sell Robert Chiltern a certain thing. If he won't pay me my price, he will have to pay the world a greater price. There is no more to be said. I must go. Good-bye. Won't you shake hands? With you? No. Your transaction with Robert Chiltern may pass as a loathsome commercial transaction of a loathsome commercial age. But you seem to have forgotten that you came here tonight to talk of love. You whose lips desecrated the word love. You to whom the thing is a book closely sealed went this afternoon to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in the world to degrade her husband in her eyes, to try and kill her love for him, to put poison in her heart and bitterness in her life, to break her idol, and, it may be, spoil her soul. That I cannot forgive you. That was horrible. For that there can be no forgiveness. Arthur, you are unjust to me. Believe me, you are quite unjust to me. I didn't go to taunt Gertrude at all. I had no idea of doing anything of the kind when I entered. I called with Lady Markby simply to ask whether an ornament, a jewel that I lost somewhere last night, had been found at the Chilterns. If you don't believe me, you can ask Lady Markby. She will tell you it is true. The scene that occurred happened after Lady Markby had left and was really forced on me by Gertrude's rudeness and sneers. I called, oh, a little out of malice, if you like, but really, to ask if a diamond brooch of mine had been found. That was the origin of the whole thing. A diamond snake brooch with a ruby? Yes, how do you know? Because it is found. In point of fact, I found it myself, and stupidly forgot to tell the butler anything about it as I was leaving. Goes over to the writing-table and pulls out the drawer. It is in this drawer. Not that one. This is the brooch, isn't it? Holds up the brooch. Yes, I am so glad to get it back. It was a present. Won't you wear it? Certainly, if you pin it in. Lord Goring suddenly clasps it on her arm. Why do you put it on as a bracelet? I never knew it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? Holding out her handsome arm. No, but it looks very well on me as a bracelet, doesn't it? Yes, much better than when I saw it last. When did you see it last? Calmly. Oh, ten years ago, on Lady Berkshire, from whom you stole it. Starting. What do you mean? 
I mean that you stole that ornament from my cousin, Mary Berkshire, to whom I gave it when she was married. Suspicion fell on a wretched servant, who was sent away in disgrace. I recognized it last night. I determined to say nothing about it till I had found the thief. I have found the thief now, and I have heard her own confession. Tossing her head. It is not true. You know it is true. Why, thief is written across your face at this very moment. I will deny the whole affair from beginning to end. I will say that I have never seen this wretched thing, that it was never in my possession. Mrs. Cheveley tries to get the bracelet off her arm, but fails. Lord Goring looks on amused. Her thin fingers tear at the jewel to no purpose. A curse breaks from her. The drawback of stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheveley, is that one never knows how wonderful the thing that one steals is. You can't get that bracelet off unless you know where the spring is. And I see you don't know where the spring is. It is rather difficult to find. You brute! You coward! She tries again to unclasp the bracelet, but fails. Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. Again tears at the bracelet in a paroxysm of rage, with inarticulate sounds. Then stops and looks at Lord Goring. What are you going to do? I am going to ring for my servant. He is an admirable servant, always comes in the moment one rings for him. When he comes, I will tell him to fetch the police. Trembling. The police? What for? Tomorrow the Berkshires will prosecute you. That is what the police are for. Is now in an agony of physical terror. Her face is distorted, her mouth awry, her mask has fallen from her. She is, for the moment, dreadful to look at. Don't do that. I will do anything you want, anything in the world you want. Give me Robert Chiltern's letter. Stop, stop. Let me have time to think. Give me Robert Chiltern's letter. I have not got it with me. I will give it to you tomorrow. You know you are lying. Give it to me at once. Mrs. Cheveley pulls the letter out and hands it to him. She is horribly pale. This is it? In a hoarse voice. Yes. Takes the letter, examines it, sighs, and burns it with the lamp. For so well-dressed a woman, Mrs. Cheveley, you have moments of admirable common sense. I congratulate you. Catches sight of Lady Chilton's letter, the cover of which is just showing from under the blotting-book. Please get me a glass of water. Certainly. Goes to the corner of the room and pours out a glass of water. While his back is turned, Mrs. Cheveley steals Lady Chilton's letter. When Lord Goring returns with the glass, she refuses it with a gesture. Thank you. Will you help me on with my cloak? With pleasure. Puts her cloak on. Thanks. I am never going to try to harm Robert Chiltern again. Fortunately, you have not the chance, Mrs. Cheveley. Well, if even I had the chance, I wouldn't. On the contrary, I am going to render him a great service. I am charmed to hear it. It is a reformation. Yes, I can't bear so upright a gentleman, so honourable an English gentleman, being so shamefully deceived, and so— well? I find that somehow Gertrude Chiltern's dying speech and confession has strayed into my pocket. What do you mean? With a bitter note of triumph in her voice. I mean that I am going to send Robert Chiltern the love letter his wife wrote to you last night. Love letter? Laughing. I want you. I trust you. I am coming to you, Gertrude. Lord Goring rushes to the bureau and takes up the envelope, finds it is empty, and turns round. You wretched woman! Must you always be thieving? Give me back that letter. I'll take it from you by force. You shall not leave my room till I have got it. He rushes towards her, but Mrs. Cheveley at once puts her hand on the electric bell that is on the table. 
The bell sounds with shrill reverberations, and Phipps enters. After a pause. Lord Goring merely rang that you should show me out. Good night, Lord Goring. Goes out, followed by Phipps. Her face is illuminated with evil triumph. There is joy in her eyes. Youth seems to have come back to her. Her last glance is like a swift arrow. Lord Goring bites his lip and lights his cigarette. End of Act Three. Fourth Act. Scene. Same as Act Two. Lord Goring is standing by the fireplace with his hands in his pockets. He is looking rather bored. Pulls out his watch, inspects it, and rings the bell. It is a great nuisance. I can't find any one in this house to talk to, and I am full of interesting information. I feel like the late.